things that is so great. I can't even be jealous of the guy that produced this because it's so far out of my league. I'm amazed that something like Beethoven or Plato exists at all. But uh, Plato is uh, at his best in the Republic. And uh, I'm hoping that you will enjoy this and that you will uh, change the way you think. It's the best way I can explain it. Uh, it was like an atomic bomb in my brain uh, when I was 20 years old. And uh, yeah, I was well, thinking, yes? Yes? Turn yourself on. I think, uh, Bobby, your mic might be bleeding here and there. The one driving. That's it. Yeah, I, I think you can mute, like, in the bottom left uh, corner. Possibly so. Um, I'd like to hear from you. Uh, have you read Plato's Republic before? I guess that would be my first question. Come on, somebody has to say, yeah, I have read it. Yes, Please. I've yes. read most yeah. of them, but not all. All right, the whole thing? Yeah. No. Yes. Excerpts, which, yeah. No, it's... I just read it during a philosophy Yeah, class. the whole thing at once. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've not read it. This will be the first time. Okay, here's the deal. Um, it used to be in uh, Japanese counting of birthdays, the actual day you were born was your first birthday, not your zero birthday as we do it here, all right? And uh, it turns out that uh, although the... Oh, excuse me, I just have a little problem with my back. Um, that although uh, the... Uh, oh, I got a little more in, sorry. At all. Okay, they're in. Um, I'm sorry, what was I? Uh, China and Greece, zero and one. Uh, you were uh, talking about uh, Japan and the zeroth birthday. China, China. Okay, yeah. Uh, what was I? Oh, and it, you'll find that this is actually connected to the Republic. Because uh, if you start at the zero birthday, all right, um, you're going to have a very different capacity to manipulate numbers. One of the things that you need to know about the Republic, or in, in some ways about all the Greeks, is that they are primarily concerned with explaining how arithmetic is possible. In other words, you get all kinds of... Uh, uh, poetry, you get all kinds of metaphor and religion and miracles and a whole bunch of other stuff. And yet when people do arithmetic, um, there's surprisingly little argument to have. And what they're trying to find out how can we get certainty? And Plato's going to take a stab at that in this, uh, in this uh, book. So the Republic is arguably um, or I, I'm going to argue that it's a book that can change your mind and change your life. Uh, those of you who know the other Platonic Dialogues uh, will be at something of an advantage, and we're going to look at a couple of those, including the Symposium. But uh, we're going to think about uh, heroism and what it means to be an excellent human being. And Plato is going to give us a set of virtues uh, wisdom, courage, moderation, and justice, which I actually think are really great ideas. I mean, don't leave home without them. So uh, we'll be doing Plato, and that's it's what our year will be about. But uh, in getting ready for it, I have to show you some of the other uh, currents of thought going on. All right? So uh, Homer is the great educator of Greece, and... Uh, Plato thinks he has to go. He's a miseducator. Imagine if young men, aristocratic men who are going to have some influence when they grow up, uh, just th think that it's a good idea to behave like Achilles, right? Who's really mentally undeveloped. Uh, and that actually did happen. There is no, uh, that's not unusual. 
But uh, the same sort of thing would be a problem with Odysseus. Odysseus is smarter, but he lacks a moral, uh, a moral focus until he actually gets home and pulls things together. But if you stop and think about what Achilles, what uh, Odysseus does right after they leave uh, Troy, you know, full of loot and everything, they sack a city for no good reason, and then they. Uh, uh, get into a conflict with the Cyclops, and uh, uh, Odysseus gives uh, gives in to his childish arrogance, and the result is that uh, he has the terrible ten years getting home because of his own arrogance. So uh, these are flawed heroes. These are flawed conceptions of human excellence in Plato's um, uh, understanding. The question then that has to get addressed is what makes somebody excellent? There's version 1.0, I will kill you. There's version uh, 2.0, which is I can trick you or I can kill you. And uh, the third version is uh, Socrates. And he said, um, you're tricking yourself and that will lead to you killing you, which is sadly true. In other words, Socrates is an ironic Odysseus and an ironic uh, so, uh, Achilles. And the Platonic dialogues taken together are one giant artistic and intellectual structure. You wouldn't think that possible since this is, you know, easily 2,000 pages of serious reading. But uh, it's somewhat like the 18 holes on a golf course, right? Uh, some of the holes are more famous and more difficult than others, but they all are connected by a kind of architect that uh, has a pattern in mind. We won't do all of them, but we'll do a couple. We'll do our, the uh, symposium, which is very important. And uh, we're also going to do some of the uh, great dramatists as well. I think there's a lot to be learned from tragedy as well as comedy. And uh, we'll also talk briefly about uh, uh, lyric poetry as well. So uh, I'm hoping that you'll enjoy a chance to swim in the deep water, but not be in any danger of drowning. There are no exams. It's all chill, right? Uh, I would, you know, it would be advantageous to you if you want to learn to get the reading done before the lecture and the discussion. But, uh, you know, if you can't, you can't. I mean, it's a movable feast, right? So uh, those of you who have read The Republic, let me tell you the sad truth. You haven't. <laughs> oh, and that's what was going on with China there, of course. The first time you read The Republic is not your first time. It's your zeroth time. All right? You think you understood what you read. Uh, no, you didn't. You think you didn't understand what you read. You have no, how, no idea how far you are from uh, understanding what's going on there. Right? So you can't read Plato's Republic until you've already read it once. I will explain that later on. It's true. Okay? Uh, and... If you want to read outside uh, literature sources, um, you can. There are lots of them, but I wouldn't, actually. i just go back and look at the thing again. I mean, if you musicians, you're never going to lose by listening to Beethoven attentively. And if you're a thinker or a writer, Plato will teach you how to think and how to write. And he will do things with a book, and I'm... I can guarantee this for you right now. Honest to God, um, you will say, like I did when I figured it out, um, I didn't know books could do that. So stuff beyond what you think you can do with a book, he does. And uh, he's uh, an extraordinary uh, thinker. I think the greatest thinker in the Western tradition. And uh, I think this is his greatest book. So... Um, I'm teaching that because I love it, and I hope you grow to love it too. And loving it involves criticizing it. The best thing you can do 
to be a student of Plato is not to roll over and play dead and say that Plato taught me ABC and that's what the world is. That's not what he's trying to teach you. There aren't any platonic dogmas exactly because they're shifting. They're always tentative, hypothetical, and provisional. We'll see what comes next. So uh, you'll find that uh, Plato is not as dogmatic as he is often described. And in addition to that, um, Socrates certainly is the patron saint of uh, rational inquiry. So uh, I'm hoping that when you get the For stuff sure. that, that surrounds it, you'll understand what the Republic is really about. And you can't do that until at least your second reading, which is really your first. I've read it so yeah. more than 50 times. Hmm? I've read it as much as I've read Measure for Measure. It's just one of those things. Uh -huh. Half hour. Really half hour. Take them out? Mm -hmm. All right, uh, hey, yeah, hey, If there's any actual days off, like one five zero three 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 zero nine. Hey guys, move yourselves. Between those days, there's two days that you already have okay. off. You need to do that separately. Like you need to do it into separate. Okay. Um, uh, I'm sorry. I'm hopeless with with digital stuff, and uh, uh, my memory, uh, particularly of uh, old books, is uh, well, a lot of it has flowed down into my beard. My beard is sentient, and uh, it contains everything that I knew once that I've forgotten. So uh, I'll try and explain um, why the Greeks are so important. I'll compare them historically to the Chinese, which is the real important comparison. Um, I'm going to talk about different conceptions of human excellence. We might call that virtue. The Greeks called it arete. So... Uh, this is a course that's interesting because it offers us uh, topics to explore that we, people don't usually get involved with. And, you know, you don't need to get a grade at the end. So you, everybody that's here wants to be here and listen and talk and read. And uh, I'm actually amazed there are this many people that still read. Uh, it seems like books are obsolete. Tell me what, uh, I mean, any questions that you might have about this? About uh, Homer? Yeah. Or Plato? Come on. Uh, yeah, I do. Um, well, you were t in the lecture, you talked about the three versions I mean, of uh, the Greek hero. Yeah. And, uh, and it's clear that version 1.0 and 2.0 were obviously widely spread through Homer. And But the third, uh, but version 3.0 is Socrates. How was that infused through Greek society? Because Plato isn't as accessible as Homer. So how, how was Socrates, uh, how did Socrates influence the mass of ancient Greece? He didn't influence the mass of ancient Greece. He had no interest in the mass of ancient anything. As a matter of fact, modern anything. Um, he was a Greek, which means he believes in human inequality, like the Romans. If you like the idea of human inequality, you're not going to find it in the Greco-Romans. Uh, that is one of the real big issues here. All right. So what Christianity is going to add is the stuff that the Greco-Romans let slide because they're all being reasonable. All right. <laughs> so um, I'd be inclined to say that uh, Socrates is a unique kind of hero. And if you've ever read the, uh, the symposium, it turns out that Socrates is in disguise. He's not really human. He's uh, not a god but he's not human. He's a powerful spirit which mediates between heaven and earth. It's the spirit of love. I mean, and look, he falls in love with his, with his beloved, not Xantippa, but uh, a priestess whose name was Diatima. And in Greek, that means the honor of God. So uh, you're going to find that Socrates is not going to be like, look, you can, there are many ways in which you can compare uh, the Homeric heroes with other heroes going around crashing and killing things. Medieval epics, both in Europe and in West Africa, have pretty much the same kind of characters doing pretty much the same kind of things. Uh, on the other hand, Socrates, there's not many of that. That's an unusual thing. And uh, there's nobody exactly like him. Even Alcibiades says that at the end of the symposium. So... Uh, 
a hero of peaceful violence who uh, hurts your pride, not your life. <laughs> and actually have being having your, your pride subtracted from you is agonizing and it's what everybody needs. <laughs> so Socrates is unlike anybody else. And uh, uh, that's why I think that he's well worth thinking about and well worth reading. Uh, now, remember that Plato, uh, one of the things that I'm talking about was the seventh letter. Nobody knows if it's real or not. Most scholars think the others aren't, which places it in kind of dubious company. I think we have to be fair there. But maybe we can make special, do some special pleading for this because it tells us that Plato has some esoteric doctrine. Now, if you've ever read Plotinus or Neoplatonism or any of the mumbo jumbo that might be uh, derived from Plato's occasionally walk, uh, uh, occasional walk into a sort of uh, poetic cul-de-sac in which he gives you a myth because he doesn't know what else he's supposed to say. So uh, um, Plato is primarily an artist who was corrected by Socrates into making moral art. And that's one of the most important questions in aesthetics just by itself. What's the relationship between aesthetics and ethics? Do we judge ethics on the basis of beauty or do we judge art or yeah, our uh, aesthetics on the basis of uh, morality, however you define that, utilitarian or Kantian or whatever it is, which is Trump. So we're going to read a book that is about everything, which is kind of unusual. Uh, you're going to find that Plato's Republic um, talks about every topic of serious concern to anyone looking at the human predicament. And uh, I love it. And uh, I, I, I actually like teaching it to people, especially the point where there are a couple of points where I know you, your jaws are going to drop and you're going to go, uh, and that's when it will be uh, uh, changing your mind. You'll feel new grooves being cut in your brain by Plato. Uh, it happened to me. If things work out, it'll happen to you. All right. Uh, anybody else have any questions about what I'm doing or why I'm doing it? Or, you know, I, I would like people to know about this. I think it's good for them. Uh, I actually had a question. Oh, you're back, of... Evan? Yes. Yeah, I exactly. remember you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, hopefully for good reasons. <laughs> um, good. Me and s some other people who are also in this chat were discussing um, what uh, the one thing stuck out particularly that we got to a big discussion about, um, which was when uh, Plato says uh, that he tried to advise Dionysius um, in the pursuit of virtue, but above all, to become a friend to himself. And we were kind of wondering what that means. And it devolved into kind of a discussion of pitting Nietzsche against Plato. Um, but I was Actually, hoping you're moving in the right direction there. I mean, uh, but I was hoping you could shed some light on maybe what yeah, you... We don't need... I mean, I know that Nietzsche is better, better known, so I understand the reach to him, and that's a very good choice, tell you the truth. But if you want to get somebody more uh, contemporary to Plato, you'll find a big chunk of what you're going to find in Nietzsche in Callicles. Uh, it, he takes up the last third of the dialogue called the Gorgias. His idea is that you want big appetites to satisfy them all the time. And then you want even bigger appetites to satisfy them. So if you can be a totally megalomaniacal, authoritarian sort of ruler, that's the best possible life because uh, freedom is libido. And this gives you a chance to maximize your libido. Okay. And Socrates says, no, actually, that's a grossly imbalanced soul. You're gonna mess. You've already messed up your mind. You're gonna mess up your life, and uh, this is really a bad idea. And uh, seeing these guys go at it is, I think, that Nietzsche Socrates conflict that you were talking about. Go back and have a look at him. You know, that's why. Again, Nietzsche is a, a wonderful writer, but if you read back enough into the stuff that he had, a lot of it gets lifted.
right? Uh, Dionysus. I mean, that's quite a name for yourself. Um, the problem is that these rulers, these tyrants, both Dion and Dionysus, um, got bad educations. Their souls were corrupted. Think of the of what Plato believes in the Republic. And of course, if your soul is corrupt, then you're not going to behave in a more in an ethically pro proper fashion. And if you're not moral, then politics goes awry because what you want to do is impose moral order on politics. Right? So uh, this is actually a very complicated, interesting argument. And uh, if any of you know the kids game shoots and ladders, right? Where you go to one and then you slide down and you find yourself over on the other side of the board doing something you hadn't expected to be doing up or down or crossways. Um, imagine uh, much of the verbal uh, uniqueness, weirdness of the Republic stems from the fact, and oh, Marcus Aurelius in Proverbs, yes, you're right, but please don't, don't lead me not astray. <laughs> um, What am I? You were talking about the shoots and ladders of Plato's. Republic. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Imagine uh, shoots and ladders, but on uh, something more like a continental scale. I mean, the things that go on inside this and the things that you will, you know, you open one door. Uh, have you ever seen the Matrix and then you find yourself in the mountains? Well, Plato does that all the time just with words. I mean, it's messed up. It will mess with your brain. Uh, you will realize that you didn't realize it would be that smart. All right? He's thought up the answers to questions that you wouldn't have thought up. Um, so uh, Plato is like shoots and ladders, and uh, it's uh, a very complicated sort of structure. Uh, have you ever seen that thing, three-dimensional chess? All right, well, Plato plays n dimensions chess and uh i'm surprised that anybody can do that but he can trust me on this if at the end of a year you come and you read this stuff and you find that uh no this guy's a real feeb what a lame i really forgot nothing out of plato um uh i'm gonna have to reevaluate my occupation because i guarantee that this is some of the best stuff that ever was created by ink and paper. Uh, I've read lots of books, and uh, went. And this is this is. I think this is the greatest single book ever written. I get a lot of crap from people, well, not a lot, but some when they hit me back with the Bible. But we're not taking that. Uh, you know, first of all, you can't get help from God, right? We won't have that. Second of all, it's not a book. It's a small library written over like a thousand years by probably a thousand people, scribes and all the rest of this. And uh, so, no, I, I'm not going to be pushed back on this. Uh, I've read the Bible and really like it, but I really like Plato. And I know that's damnable, but I really do. I feel like Petrarch felt about Cicero. I mean, I'd like to be a Christian if this wasn't so goddamn beautiful. And then I'm thinking, well, you know, I'm, now I'm feeling all Athenian. <laughs> right, no, I mean, who's more seductive than Socrates? And who's more chaste? Allow that to mess with your mind for a while, right? <laughs> That's how he drives you into a frenzy, you know. Uh, he's a, a unique and amazing character. There are others that I like in the same league, like Confucius or Ashoka, but... Uh, I got to admit, Socrates is inimitable. Uh, he once uh, was in, the, well, the stories about him are apocryphal, but or we don't know if they're apocryphal, but they may be, they may be not. But a, a young man came up to Socrates in the Agora one day, and he said, Socrates, my parents have arranged a marriage for you, uh, for me. Um, you're a married man. You have a family. Uh what do you say? Is it a good idea for me to get married or not? And he said, and he stopped, thought about it. Yes, the Buddha is impressive. Don't do that to me. But Socrates said to him, yeah, by all means, get married. 
uh, it's a good idea, young man. And you have to remember that, that back then they didn't have romantic love and dating and stuff. All marriages are arranged. So he said, yeah, it's a good idea, young man, because if you get a good wife, you'll become happy. And if you get a bad wife, you'll become a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> right. And he has had a lot of strife with Zantippa, his wife, because she wants him to get a job. And he thinks that, no, I really have to go talk about the form of the good. And she's really not up for this because, you know, she wants some income. So uh, Socrates had a great sense of humor. And the only thing he found funny in the dialogues is his own death. But most of the dialogues are both comic and tragic at the same time. And epic. And that really will tell us something. Socrates not only intends to uh, take on Homer, for primacy in Greek culture, he intends to <laughs> he intends to supersede all of Greek literature. They have one great epic poet, Homer. He's done. I got a new Homeric hero, better than better than one and two put together. Uh, in addition to that, those of you who know Socrates' death scene, the Phaedo, um, he laughs, um, and that's necessary because everybody else is crying. You know why? Because Plato, although we're going to kick uh, tragedy out in the Republic because it's so wicked, we are at the same time going to replace it with something better. It's called Plato. The same way we're going to replace Homer with something better called Plato. Now, when we get to the symposium, it's going to turn out that uh, Aristophanes, who lampooned Socrates, is a pig. And Plato is going to be really unkind with Aristophanes because he's settling some scores because he thinks Aristophanes helped kill his master. But the point is this, looking back at the, uh, at the symposium, or rather at the Phaedo where Socrates Did you died. find the money? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, gotcha. Thank you. Oh. What? Are you going to go smoke? No, I'm going to pick up my laundry. Hey. Hello? Guys, mute your mic. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? We we hear you, sir. Right. We just hear other people that should not. All right, be I'm sorry. I don't know what they're doing. Um, um, is there a way you, as a host, can like just like uh, disable other people's uh, mics just in general? I, I, I know there I is a general setting, but I think it's only available. To oh yeah, I see. I think it says mute all. Do you want me to mute all? I don't want to mute all unless you, you might mean, have a question to ask or something to say. We could and always really just message our questions. All right. I, I think uh, if you mute if you mute all, I think people can still unmute, but it means people who are idle in the chat who have accidentally left their mics unmuted won't. All right. Well, let's let's it. try it. I mean, let's experiment with digital technology. Now you are all muted. Mute all current and new participants. I must suck. So no dialectic for us, eh? Okay. So I can still unmute, and can you hear me? Oh, you can, yeah. Oh, okay. yes, I can. All right, so that didn't do anything. All right. Well, no, it, it, it does. It's for the people who are not necessarily contributing, but are just idle, and they don't realize that they're not muted. Oh, yeah. I'm all right. I remember where I was stopped, okay? Um, the reason why in his death scene, Socrates is laughing, and everybody else is crying is Plato's taking over tragedy and comedy, too. You see, those are all going to have to go when we start censoring every kind of literature. But lucky for us, we have something to put exactly in its place. So the greatest uh, epic writer, Homer, he's on the way out. The greatest tragedians take them all on and crush them with Socrates' death scene. You want to see something that gives you a fear and pity? Human stupidity. And, and malice, they have something to be afraid of. Uh, you know what's funny? These people think that my death is a big deal. Um, if it's a big deal, I would be worried about it. Let me help you out here. You guys are all weeping. Why? Because I'm going. Oh, well, what do you want it from me? I'm 70 years old, and I'm drinking hemlock. <laughs> so it's a combination of comedy, tragedy, epic, and if you go to the Phaedrus, you will find that it's a, a kind of uh, erotic personal poetry 
out in nature outside the, the uh, walls of the city. And everybody that gets referenced there is a lyric poet because Plato is gunning them down. So if you understand there are four kinds of Greek literature and Plato's decided, well, we can get rid of this because I have something else, me. And uh, in addition to that, I'd like to, to uh, make a foundational contribution to uh, ethics and politics and uh, also to metaphysics. I want to solve most of the outstanding problems of my age. Oh, and also I'd like to start a, a new religion, a kind of math, a kind of rational monotheism where you tell what Yahweh not to have any more feelings and just sit there being a crystal. All right. It's pretty much the same thing. Yahweh gets pissed off. The crystal just sits there looking, I mean, as a, with an expression on its crystalline face, are you stupid? I mean, it's not going to intervene. It's not that interesting to, in us. Um, that's one of the things you're going to find with the Greek account uh, of uh, God and uh, Plato and Aristotle. Uh, they're uh, very different from us. And I, you can sort of understand that they're not all interested in us. Right? It's one of the nice things about uh, monotheism. Uh, Plato's given us a cold monotheism, an impersonal monotheism, but that's what it's going to turn out to be. We're all going to worship the form of the good. We're going to dance around and say how it creates all reality and all understanding and all of everything that could ever be said. But it turns out it can't be said. So it's just really great. <laughs> it is a little bit like um, the sacred name of Yahweh. I mean, you can't say it. Language breaks down when you hit that black hole of this absolute thing. Right? And what happens then? Plato comes out and gives us the old poetic soft shoe. That reminds me of a myth. <laughs> and uh, Plato's dropping in myths all the time. But fortunately for us, um, we uh, won't need anybody else because he'll make all our myths for, for us, like the myth of Ur at the end, or the myth of uh, the metals in the beginning, or uh, uh, any of the other myths that get introduced, uh, the noble lie, for example. So uh, Plato is the true Renaissance man. Uh, I think that his mind is in the same league of, as, you know, Einstein or Newton or Goethe or, uh, you know, I don't know who else I would choose, Shakespeare. But, I mean, much as I admire Shakespeare, and look, it is the test of a real poet of a real dramatist to be able to write both first rate comedies and first rate tragedies. Uh, think of how few people can do that, but Shakespeare could, Goethe could, and ironically, Plato could. That, all right, now let's move further. Let's see. Well, how many of them wrote epics? Well, is it a mock epic for Shakespeare? So you might make that work. Well, how many started their own religion? Well, there you see Plato is starting to leave people behind. Well, how about solving all the intellectual problems of your age? Well, <laughs> things are simpler than that. <laughs> you know, in other words, Plato was sort of like the Vegematic on late night TV. I mean, it slices, it dices, it walks your dog, it <laughs> locks the door, it, it does every possible thing you could want a, a book to do and a whole collection of stuff that you don't know that books can do. And once you find out they can, you're going to want that. So this is going to be a great time, I think. And I would like to have more back and forth in the uh, evening after you hear whatever it is I have to say. And then uh, I was hoping that we could have a drink together and relax and uh, enjoy this because, you know, there's no competition here. There's no grades. No salesman will call. It's just we'll talk about something, some stuff that's really cool. And I want to do this uh, uh, before my brain completely turns into Swiss cheese. And I end up hiding my own Easter eggs. So I'm thinking maybe I should start to, to download some of the stuff I know. And I have, you know, with the lectures that I put up, but um, there's so many other things I would like to say. Um, any questions about what's going on, what we're doing, how we're doing it like this? Yes, I have a question. Hi. Yes, hi. Uh, good evening. Um, I was 
pretty intrigued by your um, emphasis quite times about uh, considering Plato to be an artist. Oh yeah. And um, it kind of reminded me of when I read uh, What is Philosophy by Deleuze. And he was saying that philosophy is the art of creating concepts. And um, here is um, an inquiry that I have, because I've always been intrigued uh, by, although my knowledge of Plato is, you know, uh, less than a drop, is um, exactly what you said that he kind of was rejecting Homer as a miseducator. And as an artist uh, that created the concept of, which I think probably is the most potent concept created by human being, uh, the concept of idea. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was always wondering like, what's the material? Like, like, what did he work with? I mean, it's like the academic approach would be to go look for I don't know what was happening at that time and that kind of stuff, you know, but I get a, like a shadow of an idea of his method. Okay. But I'm always intrigued by the material. Um, Plato is infinitely intriguing. Uh, if there's a, as many hidden word games as to say Joyce, all right, if you've read jo Joyce's novels, I mean, the, the spectacular in their complexity, sometimes like a labyrinth more than like a, uh, uh, any a path to enlightenment that's not too demanding. But with Plato, um, there's a, a, another good apocryphal story independent of uh, his marriage advice. And this was to Plato himself. Now this, again, it's not written down. It's part of the oral tradition that surrounds him, a little bit like the oral tradition that surrounds Confucius. Okay. Um, Plato... One day, met Socrates early in the morning in the Agora that just happened to pass by. And he said, Plato, you're not usually up this early. Uh, where are you going? What, you, what have you got there under your arm? And Plato said, I am going to enter the competition to, uh, uh, that's going to be given during the uh, uh, spring festival. I have three tragedies and a satyr play. And Euripides or Aeschylus or Sophocles, I'm coming, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do this better than they ever have. And Plato actually was a very gifted poet, like Homer. And one of the funny things that you'll see in Plato's attitude towards Homer is that there's at least a little bit of professional jealousy. I mean, he looks back at Homer and says, "Damn, that's good stuff." I mean, he's really good. It, almost exactly the same feeling applies when you look at the way Nietzsche thinks about Homer or thinks about Socrates or Plato. It, the reason why he hates him so much is because he has professional jealousy. He says to himself, my God, this guy is talented. This has got to be stopped. So uh, there's a little bit of the anxiety of influence going on there. Um, but Plato has something to prove, that he's the universal all-purpose poet. Every genre of literature is now going to be taken over by him. And then he's going to instruct some magistrates in uh, what other poetry to allow. <laughs> okay, so it comes with its own theory of art, its own aesthetics. So this is literally a poem that explains how you're supposed to think about poetry. That's messed up. No, it has all these kinds of things in it that will mess with your mind. Do not think that people only started thinking up messed up things recently. Uh, Plato really had, he, he can tweak all kinds of stuff in your brain and I will help him do it. Um, but let me come back to the story. Um, Socrates says, well, what you got there? And he says, I got these tragedies. I'm going to the uh, Archons and I'm going to... Uh, uh, apply because they were, they look through all the submissions and they, they choose the three best, the three best writers, and they each uh, produce a trilogy of tragedies. And so Plato says, look, I'm going to get accepted. This is my first year out. And then I'm going to win that prize. Okay. Socrates said, well, that's great. You know, because you know, I'm deeply impressed with you and with poetry and a whole bunch of other stuff that's been going on here in Athens. And I was wondering, do you think you could give an old man a a taste, a preview of, you know, what is so great about this new thing that you've uh, uh, 
that you've written. And so Plato, because he's young and thinks he's on top of things and is full of hubris and also a hugely talented poet at the same time, begins reading of what he thinks are the really good parts in his tragedy to Socrates. And he spent the whole day with Socrates. And Socrates kept asking him questions about the poetry he had written. And at the end of the day, Socrates went back home. And then uh, Plato didn't enter, enter the competition. He went back home and burned his tragedies. Now, think about what it would be like to get a, a sense of what the juvenilia of Plato look, looked like. You know, before he was moved in the direction of a moral orientation for aesthetics, right? Remember, apart from that, uh, tragic writers um, are kind of uh, complicated in the treatment of morality. I mean, think of Medea. She's angry. Fair enough. Is it necessary for her to mur murder her children? Well, I don't think so. How about when you expose kids to that? That sound like a good idea? Maybe Oedipus gouging out his own eyes or something else that's fun for the whole family? Well, Plato in the Republic comes up with the idea that education is the most important function of any government. And because it ultimately determines the character of a culture. And so uh, we can, many other things steal the limelight, but this is a book about education. And keep in mind that every philosophy of education is a disguised philosophy of human nature. Yeah. So that's in there too. <laughs> There's also uh, a philosophical psychology. We got an ethics, we got a political theory, we got a metaphysics. All the problems have been created by pre-Socratic physics and the guys who are working on uh, extrapolations from that, like Anaxagoras or uh, uh, Empedocles. Well, Socrates has decided to solve, to solve their problems just in one big move. He's going to show them where on, in the big picture they, lie, they are. And then he's going to do that with the poets. He's going to do it with the mathematicians, particularly the Pythagoreans, because they have math worship. And remember that uh, Greece is all about, how is it possible? We disagree about everything, but nobody argues about arithmetic. Hmm. All right, so now we have a problem. And we're going to gnaw away at it, but it's, it, it, Plato is the first one to bring a tree down. Said, look, I have a new system, a way of accounting for that. It does account for all of science and all of poetry and math and religion. Uh, oh, yeah, I have a myth for the afterlife and everything. Uh, <laughs> you know, like I said, this is a book that does everything the books can do. All right, up there, I see her. I mean, uh, I just see a hand. and I'm happy to get a golden hand. We're doing discord. Yeah, yeah. I, I have no idea what that means. I just feel like this is a, I mean, the, the, the raise hand function, I think is a pretty solid way of just, you know, somebody wants to, whatever, raise your hand. Raise your hand. What's up? Um, yeah. I was just wondering if, if you would say that uh, is, does Plato consider himself kind of like the final philosopher and like a, like, like Hegel or something like that? No. Okay. Plato is starting a living tradition. That's why he's so interested in the question of the living voice as opposed to the written document. If you look at the at the Phaedrus, which is not the Phaedo, the Phaedrus, which I mentioned earlier about when I was talking about lyric, um, you'll find that Socrates doesn't trust the written word because it can't defend itself. And it can give people that don't understand what it means all kinds of stupid, dangerous ideas. This is why at the very end of the Republic, we have a special child safety cap to make sure that the philosophically immature do not do anything really awful with the 300 pages that they fail to understand. So this is for Cephalus and everybody like Cephalus. They're not educable, which is why we booted them out of the discussion. And here's how it goes. Once upon a time, a guy was dead, but he wasn't really dead, but he still went to the places where dead people go. And he found out you can't bribe the gods. Found out the gods, oh, it's like Santa Claus. He knows if you've been sleeping. He knows if you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. You get omniscient, perfect justice. What does that mean? This has to replace 
the system of myths that allowed Cephalus to think that he could bribe his way out of Hades, which is what he spent the, the book doing. All right. So uh, Plato is, uh, is offering us a unified cosmos. He steps up to all the serious intellectual problems of his life or, or of his time. And uh, it's the most concentrated stuff I've ever read. Uh, because I, I'm, I'm awful at math. I'm sure there's some great, real concentrated math. But uh, in terms of how closely it has to be read, it's like Wittgenstein's Tractatus, only it looks like we're breezing through this. The real fact is that every word is in place and has a purpose. Trust me on this, I'll show you. Uh, Kevin Hine with the golden hand. Yes, two golden hands, actually. Let's start with a, three, a third golden hand. Do any of them talk? Hi, Dr. Segro. Hi. So I had, hey, I had a... Hi. Uh, I had a... I, like, I've been thinking about like the trajectory of philosophy, and there's a book by Lloyd P. Gerson called uh, Platonism and Naturalism, The Possibility of Philosophy. Hmm. And uh, we've talked before, and you called Kant neo-stoicism uh oh who's the uh oh, i just forgot the name I'm blanking on it who is he reacting to who awoke from his dogmatic you, slumber you hume. hume sounds like gorgias who wants to say that nothing exists um the 20th century philo 20th century philosophy the best one would be wittgenstein but he rejects metaphysics so it all it, it this is a big big accusation but has it all just been downhill since plato uh, no, we we do some things better now than they used to do then, like the abolition of slavery and stuff. Uh, we've learned from but history. I, but, I, understand. but I would say that the abolition of slavery like, would work with the form of justice. We learn what the form of justice is through time. Mm -hmm. um, well, it could be, as it says in the seventh letter, which we looked at, is that... Um, there are certain ultimate realities that language cannot grasp and you cannot have a linear progression from the first four things that you know about something to that th the thing that he describes as the fifth, which is some kind of spark of divine knowledge. What Plato is trying to do here is have his cake and eat it too. He wants to be the most rational mystic around. And he really has to decide what he wants to do. But Plato says, no, I don't. That's why I do poetry, because I can ar argue for this, and I can also make this so beautiful that um, it's very hard to pick this apart without feeling that you're missing something. So uh, um, I think that Plato is great because he teaches you how to read, and he teaches you how to think. And, uh, you know, I, I, I hope you like his acquaintance. All right. Uh, who another golden hand, Vinny Machado? Hello, Vinny. Um, uh, I was just wondering if you can um, say anything regarding your preference to uh, to Bloom translation. Bloom was my teacher in college. I had this. Uh, what do I call it? I had this epiphany about uh, the Republic. Uh, I was taking courses with. Uh, uh, Bloom and another one with Cropsey, you know, the guy that wrote with, with Strauss, that big, thick, gigantic political philosophy book. Well, um, when I, I got to UFC, Strauss was gone, dead, but uh, it was a heavily Straussian place. And, you know, because uh, that's a, that's a high powered kind of intellectual weirdness. Uh, and Bloom himself was, and so was Cropsey, both kind of weird guys. Um, uh, the reason why I, I like the Bloom is, first of all, because it's as literal as you're going to get. So where Plato uses uh, Dyche, every time that gets translated in the same way as justice, or uh, Arate gets translated as virtue. Um, it's when people start to get clever and sort of poetic and saying, look, Plato really isn't up to standard that uh, Bloom is at his best. Uh, 
he was like a little wizard. He's a really strange individual and dressed impeccably. But uh, um, Bloom said, look, uh, the best thing a translator can do is to actually get it across to the next generation. They want to read Plato. They don't want to read you. And that's actually, a, I mean, a wonderful thing to keep in mind. Now, uh, Bloom, his introduction, the, what is it they call it? The translator's preface. Oh, that's great. Maybe there's, a, there's an introduction as well, but the translator's preference is a, a small masterpiece of intellectual malice. Oh, does he, <laughs> does he torture uh, Jowett and everybody else? Because uh, this stuff they don't want to talk about. Some of them are just because they're Victorians. Others because they just can't have Plato telling noble lies. Because lies can't be noble. Because I, they bring that presupposition in, and that Plato has to be noble. So he's so he, they they describe it as well something that's not a lie at all. And uh, well, Bloom's point is that it says lie. <laughs> all the other times we have that word those, that says lie too so Jowett uh, translates it to something like a, 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 a useful or a useful flight of fancy and uh, Bloom just goes nuts on this uh, so he's I mean a nasty piece of work I mean it's the most venomous you know 10 pages or so you're going to read anytime soon I mean, he, why, why, in other words, Plato's Republic has been uh, translated a dozen times. Why do we need another one of these? Because everybody thinks they're smarter than Plato. And I don't think so. So I'm going to show you, give you that one-to-one -one correspondence. You want beauty? Well, um, you can have beauty, but not Plato's. <laughs> yeah, when you translate it from Greek to English, I'm going to try and give you the best idea. And, uh, yeah, I think that that was a very useful way of approaching translation. I know there are specialists that have their problems with it, but I think for the student, particularly the student without Greek, uh, that's by far the one you would want to choose. Look, you don't want to get told about a useful flight of fancy if you don't know how to go back and look at the Greek and say, don't say that. Okay. So uh, we're going. I like to use blooms. Uh, on the other hand, look, if you don't have access or it doesn't work out for you, read whatever copy of the Republic you have handy. It's all right, and sometimes the difference in translation can be actually very interesting. All right, uh, who? I mean, who is the next golden hand? Uh, yes, I will admit her. Elijah has been admitted. Okay. I have a question, uh, Dr. Sugar. Yeah. So, can you address um, historical Socrates versus Plato's invention, in, and especially in the Republic? How much of actual Socrates do you think we, we, we see there, and and how Plato is, I don't know, corrupting is, not, is a good word, but manipulating, I guess, Socrates to achieve his goals? Okay. Um, the straight answer, the, the short, direct answer is nobody knows. Um, it's like trying to separate two sides of one coin, all right? What do we know about Socrates apart from Plato's portrait of him? We know a little bit from Xenophon, right? And there, because Xenophon has such a much more pedestrian mind, he's not nearly the brilliant thinker that Plato is, um, Socrates comes off as like something a practical wise man, but nothing epoch-making like you get in Plato. It's more like uh, Benjamin Franklin, a wise old man that we like. Uh, it's because uh, Xenophon can't see anything beyond that. Now, uh, what other uh, evidence do we have about him? Uh, well, apart from Xenophon, not a lot. So we have Plato, and Plato has turned him into an, uh, a work of art. And uh, was Ar Socrates actually that artistic? Possibly so. I don't know, because he's not really like anyone else. So, look, if you are a, a PhD, a professional scholar that's looking to nail down tenure in classics, go 
and get yourself an opinion about this. <laughs> and then squeeze that evidence as hard as you can to make it say, uh, like a ventriloquist dummy, that either Socrates and Plato are completely different or utterly separate. And the separation uh, you can you have figured out by some uh, magical discrimination in the way the the thoughts are represented. But the honest thing is, nobody really knows, right? Uh, Socrates is uh, is a man, a historical man, but he's also a cultural image like uh, David and Goliath or Cain and Abel or Oedipus. So I don't think it's possible to disentangle the history from the poetry. I mean, we get a little bit from Xenophon, but we really don't have very much. Same is true, strangely enough, of all the great world's spiritual teachers. It's true of Jesus. It's true of Confucius. It's true of most of the Hebrew prophets. Uh, it's true of Buddha. Um, so uh, I'd be inclined to say that uh, it takes uh, a unique kind of figure. Uh, and he's... Sigmund Freud once said about Nietzsche that he's the only guy I can't analyze. <laughs> it's just I've looked at this too much and I throw my hands up. Who knows what Nietzsche, what goes on in Nietzsche's head? And I kind of have the same feeling about Socrates. In other words, God only knows when he's being ironic or when he's telling you the level flat truth. He may be telling you both <laughs> at different levels of understanding. He does mess up things like that. And, uh, if you mistake the uh, the irony for the literal speech, that takes you to Never Never Land. <laughs> so uh, trying to figure out how to dig yourself out from under problems to create for yourself, Plato's good at teaching you that too. Plato is the beginning of philosophy. And what makes philosophy what it, uh, the unique activity it is, is that Plato taught Aristotle and he's the right kind of student because he said to his teacher after great thought and study, you're wrong and here's why. That is the triumph of Socratic teaching. When you let them fly on their own and let them do what they want with your, with your ideas. You're not trying to create bad examples of yourself. You're trying to figure out what they can do, particularly what they can do to improve on your thinking. What that does is create a tradition of mountaintop conversations. That's what, how Nietzsche describes the history of Western thought. And in a more coherent way, that's how Hegel describes it. So the first big speaker was Socrates, but he's something of, a, of an unknown quantity. The first great philosopher is uh, Plato. And Socrates can be thought of as his alter ego, as his teacher, or uh, as his great, my greatest and most successful character. Remember at the end of the Socratic Dialogues, the last third of them or so, um, Socrates drops out of the discussion, and instead the main speaker is now called the Athenian Stranger. And you could figure out who that might be. All right, uh, who else? Give me a raised hand. Go ahead. Don't be shy. I'm Hello, Professor. Here. First Hi. of all, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. I had a question about the Homeric stories. Now, are the lessons in those more so straightforward or do they require more pondering? For example, uh, when Odysseus is talking to a, a dead Achilles and Achilles says that something to the effect of that he would prefer uh, to be working under a slave master than be with this dead lot. Now, is this lesson as simple as um, no matter what the circumstances, it's always better to be alive than dead or something beyond that. All right. Here's the, sh he goes to talk to Achilles because Achilles is not going to be able to give you any kind of intelligent prognostication about the afterlife. Will it be worth it? Uh, because Homer's going to write a whole poem about me, or is it so awful down here that I should have just stayed home? and gotten over that childish uh, search for kudos, search for honor and glory, um, Time. And uh, my view of it is that um, he's reformed. He's seen what being dead is like, and uh, 
he says, you know, life is more precious than you might actually believe. And so the idea is that first, what this is, it's a criticism of that earlier, that 1.0 version of what a hero is. Okay. Yeah. Let's go slay a bunch of stuff or, you know, uh, think of Norse uh, invaders. If they die with sword in hand, they get to go and go on drunks at Valhalla and fight all the time. Well, okay. It turns out that you don't. Instead, you're in the shades here and, uh, you know, life is better than any such stuff. So what it is, is a rejection of a certain kind of uh, suicidal uh, heroic ethic. All right. Uh, so that's what he learns. He learns empathy for Priam. And then he doesn't learn until after he's dead that he chose the wrong way. And then Odysseus, he's going to learn that uh, war is not good for him. It was harmful to him. He was unfit to come home. And it wasn't until he was broken down and his hubris had been checked that he was capable of coming home and doing what needed to be done. Right? And the big conclusion is, it is unholy to vaunt over the ba over the bodies of the dead. That's in book 22, where he talks after the killing of the suitors. And what that means is, let's not write any poem, any more poems about people getting impaled. And the reason why is that this impaling each other stuff really isn't all it's cracked up to be. Right? Here he is. He's 45 years old. He's been away for the last 20 years. And he hasn't been impaled, but he's impaled a great many people. Sometimes for a reason, sometimes just because they were there, right? That's the moral problem, the moral ambiguity of Odysseus. Yeah, he's doing what's right according to the code of honor. But, uh, I mean, for example, raiding and destroying that city for no reason. It just happened to be there while he was on his way home. Um, that means he kills things casually for no reason. That's got to be taken away from him. Right? Uh that's the best I think I can do with that. Somebody else? Um, yeah. So, uh, um, should I? Okay. Um, for uh, for next month is so it's just uh, reading a book one of the Republic. Yes. Homework. Okay, and then I would recommend that you, as soon as you possibly can, can if you want to take if you want to get the most you can out of this, as soon as you can. Do a quick and dirty reading of the Republic. Here I'm, I'm talking about the okay. death march, forced march through it. Why? Because you're not going to be able to read it the first time until <laughs> you get that first zero reading out of the way. Trust me on this. All right. Uh, what looks like incoherence is in fact uh, something like something like the tile work on a really beautiful mosque. In other words, there's an astonishing geometry to this thing. Every word in that whole thing is there for a reason. I am not joking. In the same way, if the tiles went wrong in the mosque, that would have to come down. Uh, Plato doesn't have that. Okay, cool. Oh, and also, by the way, uh, the book will teach you how to read itself. All right. Also, um, what's the where do you draw the line between the ethical and the uh, aesthetic? Or the active and the contemplative oh, life. Um, it's the pursuit of the good and pursuit of the beautiful. Sometimes they overlap. The difficulty is they don't always. Think, for example, that many of us have some moral objection to violence, and yet it's undeniable that violence can be beautiful. If you have ever seen old tapes of Muhammad Ali boxing, I mean, it's just breathtaking. He's really good at what he does. And yeah, it's violence, but you can't separate it from a certain sort of beauty. Uh, the Iliad is about a combination of the good and the beautiful, but his idea of the good is very primitive. It's starkly and uh, naively moving. Yeah, so I guess like, I guess the religions, you know, like Christianity needed Constantine to advance it, like uh, Buddhism, Ashoka, and of course, Al the Greeks, Alexander. So it's like, well, it's like, I mean, what they did, you know, they, they killed people, but they, they brought all those ideas out there. So it's kind That's of- That's exactly right. Look, um, the idea 
that it's big news that people did awful stuff to each other throughout history. Um, it's only news if you get your history from Disney movies, all right? Um, real historical stuff, uh, it's pretty bloody. It's pretty difficult. There's a new, and because I'm writing a history of the world, there's a new uh, element in our evidence, which is uh, ancient DNA, and we can actually find one population displacing, that's the nice way of putting it, displacing others. And they displace them in two ways, pretty much. There's the 45% and the 95%. The 45% works this way. Um, all the men get killed, right? And a few of the women get killed, and then they just get incorporated and used for reproduction of the new invading uh, group. Uh, that is actually how the history of Spain worked. The entire Iberian Peninsula, it's the 45% uh, percent solution. Now, it, it, that's bad, because that's like, that's like I don't know, uh, any of the really genocidal regimes that we've seen in the 20th century. But uh, it gets worse, the 95% solution. That just means kill everything you find, male, female, animal, vegetable, mineral, kill it all. Um, and that's what happened in, for example, the history of, of, the, of England. In fact, the people who created Stonehenge are completely unrelated in a genetic sense, either from the male or female line, to the people who defended England against William the Conqueror in 1066. You go to those cemeteries, this is a completely different people. They had 3,500 years in which to kill off everybody they had found there, and they succeeded in doing so. And there's just no getting around it. And this is these are not unusual activities. There's actually quite a bit of this. And this is just, uh, well, no more Disney history for us. Yeah, well, thanks for uh, your time. Thanks for answering my question. It's it always a pleasure. I mean, I, I'd i like to encourage all your, your pursuit of knowledge. It's good for you. It's one of the things you can count on. What else? Who wants a question? I did have a question, mm -hmm. actually. Okay. Sure. Uh, yeah, so you had mentioned that, uh, you know, there's the version 1.0 version 2.0 of the greek hero yeah and um it moves from kind of a violence of brutality to you know as you said mind and muscle uh was the intellectual was Homer, violence. right right being uh someone you know having some subtlety right mm -hmm. uh was that something that was a natural evolution in greek civilization do we know that or is that homer trying to i guess kind of make this coherent and and influence greek society in that way um, well, if you're asking me is, are, are these heroes prescriptive? In other words, telling people what to do, basing them right, right, yes. on this model, or is it descriptive of the way people actually work? It's actually simultaneously both because you got to remember there are generations, even centuries of around the campfire, uh, stories told of great uh, Hector and great Ajax and the great heroes. And then uh, some intelligent bard learned the stories and found a way to sew them together to create a kind of narrative to, to turn it into a plot. So uh, it seems to me like uh, it is simultaneously descriptive of at least some of the earliest elements in Greek culture, kind of the Viking element, and uh, it's also intended to be prescriptive because these men that are being talked about um, are viewed as being admirable and worthy of uh, uh, emulation. So they are also being used to bring up the next generation. So it's both prescriptive and descriptive. Fathers would learn it and make sure their sons learn it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. That was the okay. question. Thank you. Yep. Another question. So I had a quick question that I think would benefit everyone. Um, okay. And forgive me for my frankness, but you had previously alluded to things um, such as Bloom's translation and everything being there for a reason. So um, 
Leo Strauss would often refer to this as the logographic necessity. Um, mm -hmm. And this would come from Plato's Phaedrus. So, and I've been wondering about this with all of your lectures, even from those decades ago, um, to what extent will the following um, se seminars be um, premised upon this idea of the logographic necessity? And mm -hmm. um, more particularly as why that would make Bloom's translation the most relevant. So for example, um, every student of Strauss kind of took this as a given in terms of interpreting any work of Plato or Xenophon or Aristotle, for example. And this is kind of what opened the door for the idea that writers such as these write duplicitously and that the meaning is not always univocal. And that's why they're always, there seems to be this tension between the philosopher and, and Polis, for example. And so while Bloom might take this very far in some regards, I'm just wondering to what extent that might be in your in your mind as you would go through the Republic. Wow. Okay. Um, how can I say? That's a, a very complicated uh, forest of questions. I mean, uh, so it's <laughs> it's a, a many headed animal. Um, a couple of things to to think about. I'd be inclined to say. Uh, um, I like Bloom's translation because unless you put in a couple of years so you can at least dog paddle around the Greek, um, it is easy to make mistakes about what is and is not there. Okay. For example, I believe it is Paul Shorey's translation that uh, lacks the word doulo, doulos, and in Greek that's slave. Paul Shorey is committed to the idea that there's no slaves in Plato's Republic. There is, in fact, one reference to slave in Plato's Republic, and it's doulos. So in short, Shorey gives us some euphemism like servant. Uh, Bloom is saying, look, he's talking about slaves. And if he mentions it once, it's not an accident. He's just telling you that they're not all that important, but they'll be there. Okay, so that'll be part of the property given to his bronze people. Households will have slaves. Most did then, so it wouldn't have been so unusual. Now, um, let's see. Uh, the problem of writing. Um, writing, oh, writing is, uh, is speech that's been dehydrated. And you have to add the the living water in order to be able to make this palatable. And the problem is, is that it's easy to get them wrong because they can't defend themselves. Think about how many, I mean, well, I don't know, I've been an undergrad, I was an undergraduate teacher for a long time. And how many undergraduates uh, find some book in the course of a, a semester and they've decided that they are going to uh, settle a score with it? Right. And they do that in the easiest way possible by pretending it says stuff it doesn't say and then arguing against those things it doesn't say and uh, then wondering um, what the problem is. So uh, I think that what we want first is a good grasp of what it literally says. Sometimes, fair enough, that might be misleading. There's no perfect translation. But among the imperfect ones, um, I find this more useful. All right. And the reason I find it more useful is the same reason that uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas found William of Morbeck's translations of Aristotle useful. Aquinas, who's the great medieval interpreter of Aristotle, doesn't know Greek, but he has William of Morbeck, a literal guy who plods along. And if you think about what Aristotle's work is like, uh, that uh, that literal translation just begs to be done of Aristotle. I mean, I don't think anyone ever accused Aristotle of being excessively poetic. So you're not going to lose any of the metaphorical niceties. On the other hand, with Plato, there's a much greater temptation to say, I could be a better poet than him. And I think that if you can, then you shouldn't be a translator. You should just go write those poems. 
show some respect, right? And I think that the uh, the literal uh, translation is the beginning of understanding, not the end of it. All right, I'll save you two years at least studying Greek. There's a start. What else? Hi, doctor. Yep. Um, I have a bit of a personal question, and it's also somewhat um, advice. I just recently started my first year undergrad in university, and um, it just reinforced to me like how, I mean, I'm Canadian, but I'm sure it's not too dissimilar in the States, that the lack of heroism, and just even going back to kind of Homeric heroism with men, like young men just doing something something big, kind of like what Nietzsche was trying to get to. Um, <clears throat> I I feel kind of like you just feel so crushed trying to, I don't know how to say this, is trying to find a space for yourself that isn't just this kind of egalitarian conformity where we're all trying to be, I think, as you said before, we're all trying to be mandarins now. We're just just how can you fit into the bureaucracy? I'm just wondering how if maybe I'm off point or where you're going with this. Yeah. Look, <clears throat> um these are difficult times. No I mean, <laughs> part of the, the reason why we find it so difficult is that we have we imagine that other people are having a really easy time, but no. Everything looks like it's easy until you actually start doing that. In the same way, think about getting to know people. Everybody looks sane until you get to know them, and then you realize that they're half crazy, right? But they still manage to get along. Okay, so uh, I'd be inclined to say that uh, what you're looking for is a way of orienting yourself. It's a good idea to go to a university. It's the best investment you're going to make in yourself. Um, I think a lot of what goes on at, at universities is deeply corrupt, yeah. And uh, I think that much of it is uh, a combination of uh, rage and uh, the hunger for power. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my daughter is finishing up her PhD. My middle daughter is finishing up her PhD at the end of this year. And uh, I'm glad that she decided not to go into academics. She's not going to be a professor. Yeah. You know, it's just too crazy. And it's, <clears throat> it's become so corrupt <laughs> that... Uh, it needs a, a, a general overhaul, our system of education. So yeah. uh, um, what I would say, I mean, my daughter is up at U, another daughter is up at UT, uh, mm -hmm. Toronto. And yeah. uh, um, she says that there's a lot of uh, conformity in mm -hmm. thought. And there's certain bounds you don't extend past. But mm -hmm. uh, she still finds it an enjoyable place to have uh, that part of the, of her life. And I think you can too. But the thing is, look, don't pick fights unless you have a reason to, right? Yeah. And that especially goes with uh, um, your professors. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are going to be reasonable and open-minded and demand that you go to the other side of an argument just to show that you have something in the way of intellectual ability. Mm -hmm. Not everybody's like that, but that's how university education really should work forcing yeah. people to read stuff they don't like right well i've already been told basically uh <laughs> we don't do plato here or aristotle um but we we're gonna read horkheimer well uh, to just throw throw <laughs> throw us in the deep end of stuff that's more contemporary but well, hold it, I don't know. but it, the idea that anyone it would compare or Conmer yeah. to Plato and Aristotle and say, well, we don't do that stuff. I mean, when I hear stuff like that going on, and I've heard it from others too, uh, mm -hmm. what you're watching is people who have a new construction method. They yeah. start the building from the roof down. Mm -hmm. And it turns out to be much more advantageous because uh, uh, it's much easier if you know where the roof is going to be, which will be on the top. So they gradually jack the thing up and uh, they never get to the foundation. They just give you a, a roof, whatever, whatever the most important book of the last 15 minutes is. Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't, you go through college, never reading Aristotle, yeah. Plato, yeah. never reading Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Here's the deal. No one is going to give you an education. You want an education. You got to take charge of it yourself. Mm -hmm. 
get your own education. If you don't have a reading schedule, uh, get one, make one. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're, uh, if you have the chance during the summer and you can make the chance, uh, find, read all of whatever author you like best in your freshman year. I, for me, it was Shakespeare, and then Plato, and then Nietzsche. So, thank you, Doctor. My pleasure. I think I'll remember that for sure. Hey, you can all call me Mike. You don't have to call me Doctor. As I my just... mother used to say, my late mother. Uh, yeah. She's the, my son is the kind of uh, is the kind of doctor that doesn't help people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll get to each other, right? Over time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to have to go. I, I really don't have much stamina anymore. Uh, these meds are are uh, pretty strong that I take. There's some nasty stuff, expensive nasty stuff running through me. So I would like to welcome everybody that would like to read about read Plato and learn about the Greeks. And I want to try and show you what I see when I uh, when I read the Greeks, right? And uh, it's a real adventure, and I hope that you enjoy it. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank, so, you, Mike. Thank, Thank you, man. Have a good one. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Much. Thank you. Good Thank much. Good well. Thank you. Bye. See you in a month. Thank you so much. We're yes, it's so nice to see you. There's a whole Thank bunch of faces you. there. God bless you. Hide now. Yeah, Maybe. God bless us all. Wait, are, are you going to record them in the future? The uh, I think I did, didn't I? Oh, do you know how? Um, you go I know, I and you no, I just get, look, I get cool. one of the students from the university to do this. You don't think that I'm going to try and do the, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a mistake from the word go. We're never going to have anything on the internet if I'm left. It's like having Achilles figure out the Trojan horse. It's not happening. <laughs> right. Mike, still Mike, be waiting. Just, uh, Mike, just a quick question. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, some of the sections that you want us to read, like uh, for the first philosopher, Yep. Practic and so forth. I think, like, you know, if you can get someone to just put some of the sections there, then I will. I will. I'll do that everybody. tonight. Thank I'll you very that. much. Thanks right. for the Take care, everyone. The pre Socratics should make you crazy. It's good for them. <laughs> right. <laughs> you can see whether, th whether we're going to be or become what happens then. Being right. is becoming. See you in a month. All right. Let's stop. You know when this is going to be. See you in a month. Thank All you right. so much. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.